Are you looking for a resource to help introduce children to key aspects of financial literacy? Look no further. Let me introduce you to the book, Malik's First Job, Financial Principles for Teens, written by author Kerwin Phillips. This book is about a young man who goes to his first job interview, later sits down with his father to learn how to manage his money. This book not only speaks on financial literacy, but it also provides tips on key interviewing skills, the importance of community, and the power of family. To purchase your autographed copy, please visit maliksfirstjob.com. You will not be disappointed. Wanted to make sure that we did the the research so that when people are playing this game, they're learning real history as they're going through it so on our board we have some of the real businesses that existed from 1897 all the way up to 1970 right a lot of people also don't know that when tulsa black wall street was bombed and destroyed in 1921 they rebuilt it within four years right so by 1925 black wall street was on and popping again right almost bigger than it was before and then it really took 1970 1971 with urban renewal for it to then unfortunately end but long story short yes sir so there is an amazing book called black wall street riots to renaissance by hannibal b johnson right he's released two books now he also has a book that was released in 2021 i think it's called 100 years um black wall street massacre something like that um but the book that we read was from riots to renaissance by hannibal b johnson and in that book he has some of the businesses that existed during that time so that was a really good kind of launching point from us for us. Yeah. Um, after- Malik's first job podcast here to answer any questions that y'all ask. Financial literacy and resources, parents and young people becoming bosses, CEOs, future leaders, entrepreneurs, conferences and boardrooms getting sponsors secured. If you want generational wealth, Brooklyn's own Kerwin Phillip with information to help. Malik's first job podcast. Malik's Malik's podcast. Brooklyn's own Kerwin Phillip. Kerwin Kerwin Phillip. Malik's first job podcast. Podcast. Pod podcast. Brooklyn's own Kerwin Phillip. Generation wealth. Greetings. How you doing? This is Kerwin Phillip here with another episode of the Malik's first job podcast we discuss leadership, entrepreneurship, and financial literacy. Today, I got a super special guest. This is a gentleman that I met uh, a few months ago at InvestFest down in Atlanta. Um, you know, he's an entrepreneur. He has a board game that highlights the history of Black Wall Street, right? So we're going to talk about that today. So I want to welcome to the Malik's First Job podcast, Davon Travell. How you doing there, brother? You know, I'm blessed. And you know, I got a, a full stomach of some fresh lunch in me. <laughs> yeah. I'm shining out here in California. So I'm feeling real good, brother Kerwin. Appreciate the invitation. That's what's up. That's what's up. So what part of California you're in? Let's see. How how familiar are you with geography of Cali? Let, let me start there. How familiar are you? A little, a little something. You know, I know LA, San Diego. Okay. So there's LA. There's San Diego, uh-huh. and then there's the Inland Empire, right? Right between LA and San, San Diego. That's where okay. I'm, right? Riverside, Marino Valley. A lot of people probably know Rancho Cucamonga from the movie Friday. Okay. That, that's that's where we're at, all right? The that's Inland, what's up. Inland Empire. Okay, okay. And born and raised in Cali? Born born and raised in Cali. You know, I, I've traveled, traveled around a lot. And at one point, I did try to leave Cali and, and move to Atlanta. And the queen okay. vetoed it real quick, Kerwin. She was like, nah, we're not, we not, we not leaving Cali. We're not leaving work. Most of our families out here. And as we, you know, yeah. get older and want to have our kids, we want to make sure our, our village is, is nice and close and near to us. So uh, that got vetoed. So yeah, born, born and raised in California, uh, not, not going anywhere, according to the queen. Okay. And did y'all get a chance like to venture out when you went to uh, InvestFest? Can I look at the neighborhoods and stuff out there? Man, so yeah, we've been to Atlanta a few times. So okay. during that time, we didn't get a chance to to venture because you you know, InvestFest was an all day affair, right? We, yes. we just start start getting set up at like eight a.m., nine a.m. We were there all the way through seven. So by the time we were done, yeah, woo, that was done. Was, <laughs> yeah, so there was there was not too much uh, adventuring there. But the other times that we've been to Atlanta, we we've traveled a few times. I got some brothers out there, uh, some friends, okay. family. So yeah, Atlanta's a good vibe. That's what's up. That's what's up. 
so so like I mentioned, uh, you know, we met each other at Invest Fest. Okay. So so how did you hear about Invest Fest and what was your experience uh, this year? Yes, yeah, so I heard about Invest Fest probably back in twenty. 21 maybe maybe a little bit earlier just because i've been tapped into the earn your leisure podcast been listening to them and is loving mm -hmm. the amazing platform and community that they've been building up uh yeah. so I, originally i just wanted to go as a investor right just as as a person to soak up the financial literacy game uh mm -hmm. but this year we had a chance to go as a vendor yeah. we were like with all these amazing melanated people here everyone thinking business everybody basically thinking like black wall street this is the perfect time for us to be a vendor and build up our brand um yeah. so that's what we decided to do invest invest the money in it and yeah. uh, show to invest fest with our booth and try to sell these board games and overall like we got a lot of love currently during, oh, yeah. during invest fest right because again it was literally our target mar market um so yeah. we got a lot of love the only i think thing that i missed out on a little bit is I pretty much stayed at the table the whole time. Right. I, I didn't go go to the workshops, didn't get to yeah. try to network and mingle that that much. So I think right. next year when we go back, I want to be able to to move around a little bit, enjoy everything that Invest Fest has to offer. Yeah. yeah, that was my experience last year. Um, like the first year I went, you know, I had I had just released a book yeah. um that I put out Malik's first job. Mm -hmm. And I had actually had like a rolling suitcase and I was kind of I didn't have a, an official table. I was going up and down the aisles, talking That's to people, cool. networking, you know, you know, hustling the book. And then the second year, which was last year, uh, I got a table. Nice. And uh, just like you, and I brought my kids with me. Um, so, you know, sometimes like I left the kids there and I kind of ventured out a little bit, but I didn't go too far because with the book, people want to get autographed and stuff like that. So I kind of stayed kind of close, but I didn't get a chance to see any of the um, the vendor, any of the, um, the workshops or the sessions. Right. So I spent most of my time at the table, but Still, it was still a great time to still get to network and meet people and make some great connections. For sure. And then, of course, uh, this year, you know, I just came as a regular attendee, so I got a chance to mingle around. Even though I saw some of the some of the uh, sessions, I still spent the bulk of my time in the uh, vendor marketplace because that's again, as I always tell people, that's where the real connections are made. Yeah, that's where the energy is for sure. Yeah. How are your uh, your kids folded into the business? Ah, uh, you know, so they, um, you know, they, they don't show too much interest, you know, they, like they observe and, you know, and they, they applaud, you mm -hmm. know, when I, you know, I made certain accomplishments, but they just kind of sit back and observe and just uh, do their own thing for right now. Gotcha. You know, like I show them some things here and there, um, but I think, you know, when they're ready, you know, it, it'll, it'll come time for them to, you know, when, when they're ready to get the information and I'll be able to present it to them. Mm -hmm. But right now they're kind of just looking for just looking at the example that I'm setting. Got it. You know. How old? Uh 24, 19, and 15. Oh, yeah, they grown grown. Okay. Yeah. Congrats. Yeah. 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 Because even when I took them last year, you know, they didn't, you know, they just wanted to sit, sit around the table and kind of stay in the vendor marketplace. I'm like, yo, go go to some of the session, go listen right. in. You're like, no, no, no. I said, okay, well, you know. <laughs> So, I, but I still think the um, for them being there and witnessing the atmosphere, yeah, like right? that's not something that you see every day. Like you know, a room full of uh, like we had like what ten thousand folks last year, um, African American people, professional, cool, you know, professional but still laid back, right? Into business, investing, real estate, and stuff like that. Different types of conversations they do, they do, that they don't normally hear or see every day. Right. So I still think that they got something out of it. You know, even though they didn't want to attend the session, just about being there, you kind of you, ha you have to soak up the energy. Exactly. Exactly. Me and my queen, we have a little bit of a debate because I think it should be mandatory for our kids when we have them to work in the business. And she mm -hmm. thinks it should be a, a choice or right? it should be a decision. I'm just like, we're, we're putting all this sweat equity into it. We're building it up for them. It's not right. going to be a choice if, if I have anything to do with it. They have oh, to yeah. work in the business, but they can have flexibility in like the roles that they do, right? Mm -hmm. if, if one of our kids just really loves uh, social media, if another kid really loves animation and art, if another kid really loves writing stories, like we can figure out a way to pour in their unique gift into the business, but it yeah. just makes sense for their genius to be used inside of the brand for the family. Oh yeah, I think I think that that's like the best idea because not only you know do they get experience within the business, but then it's also a succession plan where they're already familiar with how the business runs, so that when you're ready to pass the baton, you know, God forbid something happened, they can continue to 
the legacy to, to move forward. Exactly. Because you got to retire someday, Kerwin. Right? Oh, of course. Someday, of course. whether it's at 80, 90, 106, or it's, uh, someday you got to be able to pass on that mantle. So, yeah, I love that. Yeah, yeah. So tell me about the game. You know, so let's talk about the game. You know, play Black Wall Street. You know, um, what is it, you know, and how'd you come up with it? Yes, sir. So I've been in education since 2012, right? Working in middle schools, high schools, trying to uh, increase the number of students that are getting into college. And also along the way, I've been teaching fundamentals of entrepreneurship, budgeting and personal development all throughout my, my journey. So finally, in 2017, I worked this summer camp called the Village Nation Uni Camp right up in okay. uh, Big Bear. I don't know if you heard of it before, but it's hosted uh -huh. by UCLA and the Village Nation. They partnered together to host this camp. And at the camp, everybody, including the counselors, need to come up with a camper name. Right. So you okay. remove yourself from you know, the, the trauma or possibly negative associations with your name uh, that you might have in your neighborhood and your family. And you come up with your own name, your own identity. So my name was Black Wall Street. All right. So that, that's what all the campers had to call me. All the students had to call me. All the counselors had to call me. But none of them knew, Kerwin, what Black Wall Street was. Right. So every time I would, you know, get get called, they were like, what? What's Black Wall Street? And I'll have to explain it over and over again. And finally, I was like, you know what, y'all? I'm going to make something so that y'all can really know what Black Wall Street is. And I'm going to come back to this camp next year. And I'm going to educate. Mm -hmm. I'm going to let y'all know what's up. Right. So long story short, after that camp, I talked with the queen and we were like, hey, I want to make a game that is going to use the real businesses from Tulsa Black Wall Street. And it's not only going to teach the history, but it's also going to teach money management, entrepreneurship, business structures, budgeting. I want this to be an all in one game for black history and entrepreneurship. So we spent you know, that year creating prototypes. And then the very next year, I came back to that camp with first editions of the game to give out to some of the kids and to the uh, the founder, Fluke Fluker of the Village Nation. So that's, oh, wow. that's really how we that's how we started. Wow. 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 You know, to create a board game is like a major accomplishment. You know, we, we, we see like uh, games has been around for quite some time, like Monopoly, Scrabble, yeah, Monopoly. You know, Life. Huh? You said Monopoly. <laughs> You over here <laughs> talking about the competition, Kerwin. Come on now. No, I'm kidding. My fault. My fault. My fault. But what was that process like to actually, you yeah. know, to come from the, the idea of wanting to create a board game and actually have it come into the physical form? What was that process like? Yeah, it was a one, it was a very fun process because I'm a I'm a very imaginative person. So I like taking things in my head and putting it out into the real world. But okay. one of the first steps was creating an MVP, right? Minimum viable product. So I literally just cut out a cardboard box and I started drawing what the board game can look like, right? How many spaces there were going to be, if there was going to be draw cards, were there, were there going to be any, uh, let's see, community chess type pieces or type spaces on there? Um, just, yeah, just really mapping it out on a cardboard box, what the game could look like. Um, and then from there was research, right? Yeah. Typically not the fun part, but I'm a, I'm a, I'm a nerd. So, I mean, right. <laughs> reading the books, walking, watching the documentaries and really trying to figure out, OK, we don't want this game to be exactly like Monopoly. Right. A lot of right. people, when they see the game at first, they think, oh, this is just like Monopoly. No. Like who? Exactly. Who? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we wanted to make sure that we did the, the research so that when people are playing this game, they're yeah. learning real history as they're going through it so on our board we have some of the real businesses that existed from 1897 all the way up to 1970 right a lot of people also don't know that when tulsa black wall street was bombed and destroyed in 1921 they yeah. rebuilt it within four years right okay. so by 1925 black wall street was on and popping again right almost bigger than it was before and then it really took 1970 1971 with urban renewal for it to yeah. then unfortunately end but long story short it was a series of prototypes and mvps right so first one cardboard box second one was walmart right going to walmart getting it printed out and then taped on a cardboard box and then by the third time i was like all right i can't draw kerwin so if we really want if we really want to take this game to the next level i need to hire somebody or partner with somebody to add the graphics that this game deserves so I yeah. called my, my friend Markel. He was a dope graphic artist. And I was like, hey, bro, 
this is the idea that I want to do. Can you help me? He was like, hey, I got you. Right. So from that, that partnership, my nerdiness in history and his graphic design work, we were then able to come up with a first edition of the game that looked like an actual game that can pay homage to Tulsa's Black Wall Street. Um, that's what's up. That, that's, that's pretty much the process. Yeah. So what was the process? And you said it within the game that the actual businesses that existed in Tulsa or highlighted in the game as well. Yes, so how did you how did you find out the, the names of those businesses? Yes, sir. So there is an amazing book called Black Wall Street Riots to Renaissance by okay. Hannibal B. Johnson. Right. He's released two books now. He also has a book that was released in 2021. I think it's called 100 Years um, Black Wall Street Massacre, something like that. Um, but okay. the book that we read was from Riots to Renaissance by Hannibal B. Johnson. And in that book, he has some of the businesses that existed during that time. So that was okay. a really good kind of launching point from us for us. Yeah. Um, after that, watching some documentaries, you're able to let's see, there's one called Before They Die. There's another one called Just Black Wall Street Documentary. YouTube right. University has tons of documentaries on there. Yeah. Uh, we know LeBron and Russell Westbrook did documentaries in 2021. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of content out there where you can watch and start to, to collect that material. But our primary resource, Hannah Will B. Johnson, Rides to Renaissance. Wow, wow, wow. You know, there were so many, there were so many different cities across the country where there were other quote unquote Black Wall Streets, right? You know, we know about the one in Tulsa, I believe in, um, of course, in Florida with yep. um, Rosewood. Um, here in Richmond, you know, we had Jackson Ward. Yeah. You know, um, there's it's just so many. Um, you know, can you kind of talk to, to talk to the uh, talk about you know the the legacy? You know, not necessarily not the legacy. But let me let me re rephrase my question. I'm okay. Gonna, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> so I'm about to edit this piece out, <laughs> but um. Okay, so now have you ever been to to Tulsa to visit? Great question. So well, I got some stories for you, Kerwin, and and pull pull me out if I if I go too far in, pull okay. me out. But uh, we did go to Tulsa in 2021, right? A hundred years after the initial bombing and massacre of Tulsa Black Wall Street, they had a huge event to pay homage to that legacy. So we went out there in 2021. And we got to meet some incredible people, like wow. historical people. So number one, we got to meet two of the last living survivors of Tulsa's Black Wall Street Massacre. That's Mother okay. Hunter and Uncle Red. And recently, um, literally a week ago, Uncle Red actually passed away at 102 years wow. old. Oh, wow. Right. At 102 years old. His sister, older sister, Mother Fletcher, is still alive. Um, but we, we were able to meet both of them in person, show them the board game, right? Just show them that's the work that we've done to, to pay yeah. homage. And at that point, it was a new edition of the game called the Masterpiece Edition that wasn't released yet. And this okay. Masterpiece Edition is beautiful. And we got to show them the board, it had these art pieces on it. And literally both of them were like, wow, yeah, made this? This game is so beautiful. It was just mm -hmm. incredible to hear that from people that literally lived this legacy. Right. Um, so that that that's one story. Another story is we were we were walking into a, a restaurant, and this wasn't in Black Wall Street. This was in, in a downtown Tulsa. Um, but we were just walking into a restaurant to get some food, and I was sitting down and I was looking, and I saw someone that looked kind of familiar. So I did a little, little Google search. I was like, "Ooh, that, that's him. That's Hannibal B. Johnson. Wow, the dude that I read his book and helped me even create this game is sitting right here." In this restaurant like it's nothing so i i, wow. I got up like like a little little nerd fan <laughs> i got up yeah. i was like oh excuse me sir uh, are you hannibal and he was like oh yes uh, i was like oh yeah i created a board game he's like black wall street game i was like yes and then we just exchanged contact he gave me his cell phone number we were able to, to connect after that but it was just a incredible moment one to just see him being a, a normal person sitting down yeah. with his team eating lunch but then also he remembered me and remembered the game as well and he said, yeah. thank you for using my book in the game, because, of course, we uh, have it in our sources in the rule book. Um, mm -hmm. And I said, thank you for writing the book. It was just it was just a dope moment, Kerwin. Wow. And we, we go back to Black Wall Street now every year. Right. Once a okay. year we come back with our entire team, we take tours with Terry Backus. We go to the Greenwood Rising Cultural Center. 
um, we learn about the history and we train our team to make sure that everybody knows this history as we're yeah. representing this history as well. Well, that's beautiful. So did he say how he how he heard about the game? So, I mean, I, I have been emailing him. He, OK, he wasn't responding to the emails, though. So I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know that he got him or maybe his assistant got him. I don't know. But I was sending emails, you know, trying to shoot my shot to to learn more, to connect with him. Um, but he hadn't responded until I was right there in that restaurant where we're in the same space. And that's the power of Invest Fest, right? That's the power mm -hmm. of going to a Black Wall Street. That's the power of going to a conference is you're in the space. You're in yep. the game and you can meet people face to face. Some some folks, as y'all know. Will ignore emails or it'll go to their draft folder or maybe they're just yeah. busy and they can't get to it but when you put yourself in the environment you can't be ignored right so right. That, and that's what we did and it was it was a great moment that's dope that's dope so how long did it take from the time you had the idea to the time you had the final product and you launched the actual board game what was that time frame in between there uh, it was one year and three months Right. Wow. We launched in November 2018 and the idea was August 2017. So year year and three months, we had wow. first edition selling and we actually sold out in for Thanksgiving. Right. That that weekend, Thanksgiving. I think that video is probably still on our social media. We we sold out of our, our first editions. And that was a big deal, Kerwin, because just two months before we had a Kickstarter campaign. OK, that completely flopped. Wow. And, you know, it's my it's my fault. And if you want that story, I can definitely tell you that story. But it, it was long story short. It was my fault. But and then we recuperated. Right. We did a new marketing campaign and then we didn't do Kickstarter anymore. We just did pre-orders on our own website. Yeah. Boom, we sold out within two months. So tell us, tell us the Kickstarter, Kickstarter story. <laughs> oh, I thought I was going to be able to skate by that one. All right. So <laughs> y'all y'all might know or you might know Dame, Dame Dash. Mm -hmm. right? And Dame Daz, he has a famous Breakfast Club interview. And on that interview, you know, he's really highlighting and promoting entrepreneurship. But then he also says you know, a couple of lines in there around the effect of if your product is real, you don't got to advertise. Right. If your work is good and you're good, you don't need a market. Right. They'll just get right. your product and they'll, they'll keep coming back. And, you know, being a young entrepreneur at the time, this is my, my first venture, Dame Dash being a, a prolific um, icon that I definitely looked up to and still look up to yeah. in, as far as business and hip hop. Um, I was like, yeah, we're real. Black, <laughs> Black Wall Street, the board game is real. It's a good product. We don't need a market. We just need to create a dope product and they will come to us. So we started the Kickstarter with no marketing strategy. Terrible idea, okay. by the way. <laughs> started Kickstarter, no marketing strategy. And if you don't know how Kickstarter works is you set your goal. And if you mm -hmm. don't reach your goal, you get zero dollars and all the money goes back to the back. Right. Right. So we set the or I set the very ambitious goal of twenty eight thousand dollars. I was wow. like twenty eight thousand is going to be able to fully fund all the board games. No, no money out of pocket. And then we can get these games to everybody by the holidays. The yeah. queen, the, the smarter of us was like, yeah. let's be more realistic. Let's do maybe $5,000, $10,000 just to get it off. I'm like, no, Sinclair. Dame Dash said, if you're real, <laughs> you don't got a market. If your product is good. So long story short, you know, we we tried that. We only yeah. got like $7,000 in funding. So we had to give all the money back. Right. I was in my little uh, imposter syndrome rocking chair for a while thinking, I'm not real. I'm not going to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> Dame Dash said. But yeah. you know, eventually got got over that. We came up with a marketing strategy, you know, started creating a Facebook group, had the Instagram, started sending emails, doing events. And then we were able to actually build a community around this concept and then sell out by Thanksgiving. We are going to get right back into the episode. But this week's podcast is sponsored by Black Wall Street, the board. If you're looking for a fun, innovative way of teaching your family about the history of Tulsa Black Wall Street and increasing financial literacy at the same time, go to playblackwallstreet.com and get yourself Black Wall Street the board game. This game will literally teach you some of the real history behind Tulsa Black Wall Street and introduce you to the three basic business structures, sole proprietor, LLC, and corporation. 
Again, head to playblackwallstreet.com to secure Black Wall Street the board game for your family today. Let's get back to the episode. Wow, wow, wow. You know, it's important, you know, to, to tell those stories, right? Because people think that uh, entrepreneurship is, you know, uh, easy ride. Like people always highlight their successes, yeah. right? And that's why, like, part of the reason why I asked the question, how long did it take from the point you had the idea to the final product was launched? Yours is, is pretty short. Like a year and some change is pretty good. Nice. You know, I know, uh, like I said, I just had a, um, a, a, met a friend of mine last week. It took him 10 years. No, not 10 years. Maybe about like five years um, to get his product off the ground. Wow. You know, from the time he had his, the initial idea. And now he's like 10 years in. And now he's, you know, he's going to networking events and he's getting some good feedback yeah. uh, by some major players in, in his industry. So, um, and like I said, oftentimes people look on Instagram and these social media sites, people highlight entrepreneurship. Like they just started yesterday and now today they're like making millions of dollars, right? right? And people think, oh man, that's, it's easy. So no, nah. oftentimes people put like a lot of time in that you don't see, you yeah. know, the ups and the downs, the failures, and then finally they kind of figure things out and then, you know, you kind of strive from there. But, um, but yeah, man, that's great. Like I said, a year and three months, man, that's, thank you. That's, that's amazing. Thank you. And, and I think, um, what, sorry, well, one, one quick one, brother Kerwin, I think what helped us is in my head, I had the deadline of by next year at the summer camp, I okay. want to have games. And I think that is something that entrepreneurs can, can use is give yourself a hard deadline that goal not be moved right give yourself a goal right whether it's three months three years ten years whatever the goal is have the goal in mind and slowly start working towards that goal because entrepreneurship just like anything else once you get the momentum going yeah you you, you keep rolling right but if you stop then you have to start that momentum and energy all over again so i like to tell yeah. people this every single day lay that or actually who said this will smith i think said this right it's not <laughs> So right. timely. Yeah, listen, a lot of stuff going on. I'm not even going to grab a hole. But but he talked about instead of trying to build a, a castle overnight, you simply right. lay a brick perfectly. Oh, yeah. Every single day you lay a brick, and then five years, ten years from now, you'll have that castle. So in entrepreneurship, think about what are your brick laying activities, whether that's reading a book, whether that's hosting a podcast. Well, that's right. creating one more rule in the rule book of your board game. But what is the brick that you're going to lay today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because people, you know, don't realize that when you set that goal, that's like creating that target for you to hit. Right. Yep. I can have a bow and arrow and let's be shooting it all throughout the room without any focus. But if I know, OK, the target is right there against the wall right in front of me, then I have a focal point to focus on. That's and now I'll be more productive with my arrows. Exactly. Right. And the same way, if you set deadlines and goals, you know, hard deadlines that you're serious about, you have people that are holding you accountable, then, you know, you'll be more effective with your time to say, you know what, I got to get this done um, by this date if, you know, if I want to achieve this particular goal. So definitely, you know, goal setting is crucial, you know, for entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. you know. So, um, so what other feedback have you received with the board game? Like, you know, how did you promote it? You know, are you in the schools, other stores? Yeah. What's that process looking like today? Got you. So you want to go feedback or promotion? Which, which one you want first? Let, let, let's go with the feedback. Oh, feedback. Okay. So um, a lot of good early feedback that we got about the game. Let's see. One thing that we definitely weren't considering at all until this family let us know was the fact that different people have different abilities of seeing colors okay and obviously seeing period um but seeing colors in particular and how our game works is the businesses or the markets in our game are color coordinated right so high schools like booker t washington high school or paul lawrence dunbar high school are going to be light blue where utilities like greenwood brick lane greenwood hospital oil company are going to be royal blue right okay um, our our restaurants, Uncle Steve's Barbecue, Huff's Cafe, Orange, our beauty salons and barbershops like Madam C.J. Walker Beauty Salon, Carter's Barbershop are black. But if you can't see colors, none of that means anything to you. Right. So we had a, a couple of families that had colorblind folks or yeah, colorblind folks within their family. And they were like, hey, 
we can't see the differences between these businesses. Can you please do something and create an element in your board game that makes it so we can still enjoy this game? I was like, okay. hey, that's a good idea. What can we do? So then we started developing these little icons that we can put on the business cards and on the board game that can differentiate between the different business markets. Right. And that's okay. just like a real small thing that we wouldn't have thought of because of our experience, but because we were, you know, welcoming community feedback, we were able to get that really dope small piece of uh addition that we can make to the game to make it that much more accessible to people around the world so that's wow. that's one um another piece of feedback that we got was as people were playing the game because these are real businesses and we're talking about real business concepts like sole proprietor llc corporation business licenses business tax intellectual property all this stuff is in the game passively happening they were like we need more information <laughs> like we're, we're we're going over a lot of stuff in this game and we can play but our kids are leaving this game wanting to actually learn more and start a business and we were like yes we got them kerwin right yeah um, so after that we started to involve more activities in our rule book that can add to the education right so now we have key terms in our rule book that go over the definitions of things like sole proprietor llc debt corporation, customer, all that good stuff. We have yeah. tables within our rule book that go through the differences between business structures, that go through the differences between intellectual properties, that goes through how to start a business from idea to brand. And then moving on even further, we started having classes, right? Live yeah. workshops just like this, where we're going through the history of Black Wall Street and how to start a business um so yeah i think we've got a lot of amazing feedback from our community over the years uh we're always very open to, to sitting down or reading an email or whenever we go to here it is this is my last one for you kerwin unless you have more okay. i can i can i can definitely keep going but all right we have our target audience when we first started was homeschooling black families that had two okay. kids eight and older right that was our target mar market when we were building out this game because we knew that homeschooling families love playing games and using other things to teach their their scholars and their kids and we yeah. also know that there's not a wide range of black history games or games that positively feature black bodies and black minds right so we knew we were in a good market right here we go to this um, event called game school con each year out here in uh, Southern California, where it's literally a bunch of homeschooling families that use games to educate their kids, right? So we yeah. started going to that and we're able to really sit down and talk to the kids, talk to the parents on how this game is able to help them within their curriculum. And they give us a lot of really good feedback. So okay. yeah, shout out to the community. We appreciate y'all. Keep the feedback coming, y'all. We, we love it. We love it. That's what's up. That's what's up. And then I guess, how do you go about promoting it? You know, yes, once you launched it. Yes, sir. So once we launched, um, definitely creating a specific Instagram page was useful. We had our we had a business brand that was called True Hell Forever. And technically this board game was property of True Hell Forever. And we tried to market it on the same website and on the same Instagram, on the same Twitter, and it wasn't working, right? We weren't getting the traction because the brands weren't aligned. So we had to right. start new Twitter, new Instagram, whole new website, new PayPal account, new Stripe account with all the branding in alignment. Uh, we right. did Facebook ads, Instagram ads, um, going to those conferences like a game school con, like a black college expo and other um, kind of small community opportunities that allowed us to sit down and table. Uh, what else did we do? Emails, of course, to our yeah. internal community. Um, offering free classes and free workshops to get people on our email list and expose them to the history of yeah. Tulsa's Black Wall Street and our board game. Um, and then last, yeah. we did a good round of uh, podcast interviews, right? Just, just like okay. this, on various yeah. podcasts that are within the realm of education, Black education, homeschooling, financial literacy, and be able to tap in with their audience. That's what's up. That's what's up. So with the game itself, What's the what's the gameplay, right? How do you play it? And then what's the ultimate goal? How does a person win in Black Wall Street? Got you. So here's the the board game right here. Let's see if the camera will 
be friendly to us, right? So you got the board right there. So as you're going around the board, you're landing on, so again, some of the real businesses that existed in Tulsa's Black Wall Street. So let's say you land on Madam C.J. Walker Beauty Salon. All right, you have two options. Every player starts off with $600 of starter capital, right? But let's say you land on Madam C.J. Walker Beauty Salon. You have two options. You can either use the business as a customer for $45, Right, so use it one time. You get your hair recut, reshave, line up your beard, do do what you do, right? Mm -hmm. Or you can pay a hundred and twenty dollars, and now you own Madam C.J. Walker Beauty Salon as a sole proprietor. And when the next person lands on it, they have to pay you, right? So that's the first decision. On every business that you land on, unless someone else owns it, you have to either use it as a customer or own it okay. as a business owner. All right. Once you own it as a sole proprietor, you can reinvest in that business, take it from a sole proprietor to an LLC. And then once okay. you own all of the beauty salons, Brother Kerwin, or you own all the restaurants or you own all the schools, right, all of one market. Now you can start making corporations. OK, wow. so that's the that's the basic gameplay. Another thing that we threw in there for we talked about goals. Right. So another thing that we threw in there to help build that goal oriented muscle is there's venture cards, right? And on this venture card, every player is going to pull a venture card at the beginning of the game, and it's their secret mission. It's their secret goal. And if they achieve this goal, they get venture capital, right? So the goal might be to own Madam C.J. Walker Beauty Salon, or it might be to own Uncle Steve's Barbecue. It might be to sell a business to another player. And if you do that, you get $300, $400, $500 of venture capital. So wow. that's essentially how it goes. It's a it's a roll and move game. There's draw cards in there. There's venture cards, and you have to make business decisions with almost every roll. Okay, and then how do you win? Ah, how do you win? You're the last entrepreneur standing. Okay, You're, when you are the last entrepreneur standing, you have won the game, and it typically doesn't last that long. Okay. I, I've lost this game in 15 minutes. <laughs> oh wow. And I made the rules. All right. So right. you can you can definitely you, your money goes quickly because every time you land on a business, you're gonna use it as a customer or you're gonna buy it as an owner. Right. So that yeah. money go really quick. And when you roll doubles, you keep rolling infinitely until you stop rolling doubles. So sometimes, you know, in other games, rolling doubles is a good thing because you can get around the board really quickly. In this yeah. game, it's you don't want to roll doubles because you go spend a okay. lot of money. Wow. 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 That's, that's pretty dope. Pretty yeah. dope. Thank you. So kind of going back, you know, to the, the concept of Black Wall Street, like you hear a lot of people say, yeah, you know, we have to recreate Black Wall Street. You know, we have to bring it back. Do you think that Black Wall Street can be recreated like a physical location where you have businesses like a black uh, business zone? 100 percent. I think it can be recreated. I think the hard part put put the quotes on it hard part is it's not going to be 100 percent black which i think is what i think is fine because back then obviously segregation was legal so black wall streets were created because it was like okay black folks or indigenous americans latin folks like you can't live in the downtown area you can only live in this zone so it was right. easier for us to create black wall streets now in 2023 I think we can have centralized places of black commerce or ethno aggregation. If you've read uh, Dr. Claude Anderson's Poweronomics, it's a mm -hmm. dope, dope book, right? He talks about ethno aggregation, which is where when groups of people with like uh, religious backgrounds, uh, cultural beliefs, right, get, get together or language and get together and build commerce. So when you think of a Chinatown, right, ethno aggregation, little Ethiopia, Ethno aggregation, right? We think of uh, Little Italy. Those are basically the models of how we can build Black Wall Streets. So I think it's 100% possible. I do have a, a project in the next probably 20 years that okay. is going to be my version of helping to rebuild and replicate Black Wall Streets across America. But I think we have a number of amazing visionaries out there who are all working to build pockets of Black commerce. Okay. And what do you think would be the, the biggest hindrance, right? Let's say so we, we try to work on that goal, say, you know, we're going to find an area, we're going to establish businesses, and this is going to be our, you know, quote unquote, Black Wall Street. 
Yeah. What would be the biggest hindrance from that happening? So historically, the biggest hindrance has been the government retaking land. Right. Mm -hmm. So this happened in, in Tulsa. This happened in New York with Seneca Village. Um, and the government uses eminent domain to right. take back land from people in order to use that land for the, the public good. Right. And I think that's going to be a continual pattern that we need to make sure that we are strategically looking out for. Right. If we know the government can use eminent domain at any point to take away land. What are the legal protections we can have in place or specific legal structures or trusts that we can have in place? that don't allow the government to retake land, right? So I think that's obstacle number one. Obstacle right. number two, again, on the legal side, is going to be people that perceive the building of these communities as anti anything else, Okay, right? which, is, which is not, right? Building a Black Wall Street in 2023 doesn't mean we're anti any other cultural group religious group or any other identity. We're just trying to make sure we have a, a pro-black space. But we've seen historically, right, even in uh, within education today, there's people that are fighting back some policies because they're pro-black and not allowing other folks inside of the, uh, the, the policy to benefit. So that's another right. thing to make sure, right? So both of these are, are legal things. I think those are really the top two. I can see pride. Mm -hmm. Pride is a big thing, and that that's on us, right? Now right. the pride thing is on us as far as one person wanting to be seen as the visionary, or you're not giving me enough profits, or I'm not being yeah. transparent enough with you know how we're using the money in an investment portfolio, and now the investors don't trust me. Those are personal things. But I think yeah. the two major things that are outside of the community are the government taking away the land. And right. folks trying to sue the the company based on discrimination. Hmm. Got you, got you. You know, I tend to think that you know it can be recreated, yes. and I think it, it will be done, but not necessarily in like in a brick and mortar sense. Mm. Right? It'll be more so like people taking that, um, having having a mindset of you know what everything that I have inside my house, I make sure is I purchase from a a black owned business. Mm -hmm. Right. So if I go, there's like a refrigerator manufacturer, appliance manufacturer. Okay. I'm going to go make sure I purchase a black owned business, right. you know, toilet paper. There's several toilet paper manufacturers, you know, people who make furniture, computers, cars, whatever. Right. It has to be a mindset from the individual, you know, because again, brick and mortar in this day and time is not necessarily feasible in all, um, you know, all different types of businesses. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think more so, you know, the online platforms like you have like buyblack.com and these different places that highlight, you know, um, you know, black owned businesses. I think um, just people who have that mindset, like you've seen examples online, people say, you know, for the next year, I'm buying everything from a black owned business. Right. You know, and I think that's something that's going to that's what the trend will be, in my opinion, of how we're going to make this thing happen. Oh, yeah. I think that's definitely but one of the ways it's going to happen, but there's something about a place that yeah. you can go to where that mindset can be just activated. Right. And yeah. I think sometimes digitally it's easy to forget because of convenience. It's easy to go to the, the Costco, the Walmart, the yeah. store on the, on the corner, whatever it is. But like when you build that community, man, yeah. it's going to be beautiful. So yeah, it's definitely going to definitely go happen. Like I said, we have our vision on what we think, it could look like, and that's going to be executed within the next 20, 25 years. But yeah. based on like, there's a lot of other people that have a similar vision. So I'm looking yeah. forward to, to hopefully connecting with some of those folks and seeing how we can do some work together. Yeah. And the thing is, it could happen both ways, right? It, you could oh. have the, the the physical location and the same because everybody doesn't go shop in the store. People go online and shop. So, right. you know, it can happen both ways. So for people that want to get more information and follow you online, and purchase the game, where can they find you? Oh yeah, make sure y'all go to playblackwallstreet.com. That's www.playblackwallstreet.com. Get yourself Black Wall Street, the board game. We are working on a, uh, a next edition right now. It's getting, it's getting cooked up right now as we speak, uh, but y'all can already go to playblackwallstreet.com, tap in, get yourself a board game, 
We also have a lot of courses that are available for you or your scholars there on Afrofuturism, the entrepreneurs behind Black Wall Street, how to start a business, uh, Du Bois and Booker T, their theories and thoughts and how they overlap, but also how they clash a little bit. All that is available at playblackwallstreet.com. And then you can follow the business Instagram at playblackwallstreet. All right. Looking forward to tapping in with y'all. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We'll have the link available in the show notes as well. All right. So, Devon, man, well, thank you for taking the time out, man, to chat with me today and chat with my audience and sharing the story of Play Black Wall Street. Easy. I appreciate the invitation. I'll see you next year in person at Invest Fest, Brother Kerwin. No doubt. No doubt. No Good. doubt. All right. And again, thank you all for tuning in today you know, for this remarkable episode. And again, don't forget to visit MalikFirstJob.com and get your copy of the book, Malik First Job, Financial Principles for Teens. All right. Y'all have a great day. Talk to y'all soon. Peace. Generation, Generation wealth, 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 wealth.